Hey, I'm Rob. If you're already totally comfortable making your lean canvas, feel free to skip this video. I'm gonna answer some of the common confusions about what to put in each square and show you how to make one without wasting a ton of time. You can use any software you want. I'm just using Google Slides here, but you can use PowerPoint, you can use Word, it doesn't really matter. It is helpful if you're able to use colors. So you start out with your technology, that's your solution, and then who it's for and what it gives them. So for example, an AI robot assistant that helps surgeons do faster, easier open heart procedures. You'll notice that there's not a ton of text here. Putting too much text is a common error. This is not gonna be a standalone document. It's meant to give people a quick, big picture view of how the whole business could potentially fit together. At this point, you can start fleshing it out. So for example, there's often gonna be multiple customer segments. So you might be selling to the surgeons, but also the hospital administrator, whoever. Let's just call it the hospital, representing some decision maker. What I would suggest is to pick a different color if they are different customer segments. The reason you do that is because you're going to get different value propositions for different customer segments. For example, the surgeons like it because it's faster and easier, but the hospitals might like it because it uh, reduces uh, mistakes and lawsuits, for example. And so that is a different value proposition for a different stakeholder. The colors basically clarify which of these people cares about which of these benefits. For example, you might realize that the hospitals themselves really value reports. So auto-generated reports and data, for example. So that might save the hospitals some time. It helps them, it gives them a paper trail to help with their lawsuits. As you get into thinking about what each segment cares about, you can realize like, okay, what do we need to add to our solution that, that's valuable? At this point, these are still hypotheses, but you're gonna go out and, and, and verify them by talking to your customers through the sales process, by building prototypes, doing your pilots, et cetera. Your unfair advantage and key metrics and channels are probably where things start to get a little bit more confusing for most people. A uh, channel is basically how you get it to them. And the simplest way to think about this is it's gonna be marketing or sales. And then within that, you're gonna have one or two options. So you might say like, okay, well, how do we reach the surgeons? Well, actually we don't reach the surgeons directly. Uh, let's go to the hospitals and we'll go to the hospitals through direct sales. And then possibly also through, let's say insurance companies, because maybe we can do some sort of partnership with insurance companies who are then gonna to talk to the hospitals and say, hey, you know, you should use this. It reduces the claims, we'll give you a discount, we'll pay for it, whatever. Each of these is essentially a hypothesis, right? Direct sales might work, PR might work, insurance partners might work, but it gives you something that you can then go out and test. And that's kind of a big piece of the value of this tool is that it raises questions, which then help direct your early stage strategy. It gives you something concrete to test in the same way that you test your technology. Your unfair advantage is probably going to involve your tech, your product, your invention, but it could involve other things. If you've got patents, that would be relevant. Your unfair advantage on the AI robot assistant might be hardware patents. We don't need to make this stuff complicated. It could be a proprietary AI. You'll have to support this with additional paperwork elsewhere, but it gives us a sense of your competitive advantages. If you had a celebrity team member, for example, let's say that you had uh, Dr. Doctorson on your team or as a board member, let's say, and this Dr. Doctorson is a famous influential thought leader in your field, that's an unfair advantage. It's difficult for others to copy or emulate, even if you throw a lot of money at the problem. Your key metrics are going to be kind of your strategic focus and you can think about it if you were reporting to your board of directors or your investors, or you were trying to track one number to figure out if you were making progress or not, that's gonna be your key metric. You're probably already covering your technical metrics elsewhere. So I would generally suggest that you look at stuff that's more user-facing or customer-facing. For hospitals, you might look at the size of your pipeline. So how many hospitals are we talking to that might credibly be able to purchase? and month over month retention. And then for surgeons, we might look at error rate to make sure that our product is actually working. So these could be our three key metrics. There's something that we're gonna report, we're gonna think about, we're probably gonna have them in our monthly updates to our investors, to our board, we're gonna track them. They're gonna become a big part of our next fundraising pitch. 
These are going to be different for every company and they're going to depend on your stage. Again, obviously there could be a million metrics that you track, but you're not going to track everything. These are the most important. Part of the point of this is it directs the conversation with your mentors and investors in the direction you care about. You're saying, hey, these are the numbers that are most important to our business right now. So if we have to talk about numbers, let's talk about these numbers. And deciding what those are is a strategic decision. Problem is pretty self-evident, so I won't write it down. Cost structure and revenue streams, uh, think in terms of orders of magnitude and how it scales. So for example, you might say that your costs are per robot manufacturing. So you've got a cost that scales in the thousands per unit. Then you've got your overall research. So it might be X million per year research and operations, let's say. So this one's a variable cost because it scales with the number sold. This one's a fixed cost. And then there might be something about your sales. Like it might take your sales team 10,000 per customer in acquisition costs. So that is another variable cost. It scales based on the number of customers that you're getting. So this obviously isn't comprehensive, but it's quick and it gives someone a sense of what your costs scale based on. Uh, this helps you think about your funding requirements. This helps you think about how your costs are going to grow or not grow as your business grows. And then also you might realize, wow, we're spending tens of thousands per customer to acquire them. Uh, if we could get that down to thousands, then we'd have a significantly better business. Your revenue streams is going to work the same way. Uh, so in this, uh, you might be charging them tens of thousands per robot setup fee, and then you might charge them per surgery. Okay, so they're paying per robot to set it up and they're paying per surgery. And then you think, does that make sense? You could run a simple financial model or you could say, actually, maybe it makes more sense uh, if we do it uh, as thousands per robot per month rental. So there's a rental fee to keep the robot on hand and then there's an additional usage amount per surgery, for example. Or you might say it's just the rental. There's a bunch of different ways that you could arrange it. Are you selling them the robot? Are you renting them the robot? Are you charging them to do the data processing? Again, these are hypotheses and you're going to test them during your sales and your customer development process while talking to, you know, the, the users, the buyers, the insurance partners here. I might put that in a slightly different color just to signify to myself, Hey, this is another group of people that we probably need to go talk to because if we're relying on insurance companies to be our channel, then obviously we have to understand their concerns and their goals and whatnot. This is a pretty good canvas. It is not a wall of text. It shows that there's two different groups. One is the user, and you could even specify if you wanted economic buyer and the surgeon is the user. Cool. Uh, that would make it a little bit easier for someone else to parse and they're kind of going to get it. And then, after this, you, you can have the full details about your, your technology, your full business plan, et cetera, if you want. The benefit of this is two or threefold. On the one hand, it helps you think through your possibilities. You can realize, wow, we're really counting on these insurance people. We, we need to go talk to them. It's also useful for communication. If you send this to an investor or a mentor, they pretty quickly get not necessarily the details of your technology, but they quickly get how the business model itself is supposed to fit together and they can help you evaluate if you're spending your time in the correct places on, on the correct activities. And that's essentially all that early stage strategy is. It's deciding how you allocate your team's time, what you focus on first, which questions you try to answer and which you leave for later. You don't have to get super worried about the aesthetics. You don't have to get worried too much about being completely, uh, well, complete. <laughs> um, the big mistakes, which we'll talk about more during the workshop, tend to be trying to jam too much stuff on here. And when you jam too much stuff in, it stops being useful. So hopefully that's helpful. It's meant to be a thinking tool and a sketch more so than a, a permanent document. So don't let it turn into a huge time drain, but hopefully it, it helps you think and it helps you share what you're thinking with others.